Hello, everybody. I'm wearing my wizard robe from Slytherin House. Kind of see the lighting. It's not the best. All right. So, this lecture is about Emil Durkheim. Uh, I'm going to try not to go into too many tangents. Emil Durkheim is my favorite social theorist, and he is ignored in modern sociology, I would argue, and misunderstood. There are so many people that criticize and attack him, um, and those attacks are based on not hearsay, but a lot of misunderstood ideas. A lot of people haven't read, like any theorist uh, or any author, right? Their first books early in their life are going to differ from their later books. So really, it's a time-consuming process to try to understand the like historical progression of a theorist. And you know, people are multifaceted, but it's way easy to criticize and knock people down, especially if everyone's doing it. So anyway, hold on. Okay, there we go. So what you need to know, test question, who founded sociology, Emil Durkheim, right? He wasn't the one to come up with the word sociology. Uh, I think Augustus Comte or Herbert Spencer, I think Comte kind of like, uh, not Dur Durkheim's mentor. Durkheim was definitely influenced by Spencer and Combe. We're not going into them. Anyway, he established it as this, as a discipline, right? He made this uh, famous journal, the An Sociologique, I don't know how to speak French, um, established sociological verse, uh, departments of sociology at university campuses. And his kind of uh, mentees, his like disciples, um, spread sociology and like converted departments uh, over or, you know, founded their own. So Comte, Augustus Comte, Durkheim's, we'll just call him his mentor. Uh, his idea for sociology was pretty grand. And in fact, like on the Brazilian flag, it says like, I don't remember exactly what the Latin phrase is, like ordum progressive, something order and progress augustus comte basically created his own secular religion basically like catholicism without the god and like kind of like a religion based on science and like a humanist philosophy there are still like branches of the, or the religion comte created in brazil and other parts of the world but the brazilian flag um the latin on there is actually from comte's like religion he created so anyway, why am I saying this? Because Comte had a grand vision of sociology. He called it the queen of the sciences. All, all scientific subjects were, you know, further and further divided in the academic world, right? Separated, you know, biology, chemistry, physics, right? They're grouped together in colleges, right? So at West Hillsley Moore, you're taking a sociology class under behavioral and social sciences, right? And then within that, uh, sort of broad category there's psychology sociology probably social work probably anthropology right so it's this also has to do with the division of labor like dividing academic departments so sociology the main idea was to unite all the sciences and how humans interacted with the sciences so the sciences would interact with each other and there would be this sort of like it's, it's basically positivism, this sort of like philo philosophical belief of science that it's the, it's almost looking at science as like a religion, right? That we have all these different cultures in the world. They will arise out of their own culture and figure out these objective truths. And then like a mono scientific culture would arise and then we'll have more social progress. So anyway, the idea of sociology when it was first started, it was pretty, pretty grand, the plan. Now, sociology exists. It's a, <laughs> most of our courses are transferable, like in your general education curriculum. But uh, it's not as popular. It's hard to get a job in the field, 
right? Like this job, I only work part time. I get okay money, but it's very competitive. The PhD programs are competitive. Um, not everybody's in a rush to get a sociology degree, right? It's not like it's early 1900s. Um, anyway, Durkheim established sociology, founded sociology. Just we'll just say he created sociology. That's a test question. Who founded sociology? Durkheim. 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 Okay. So. What are some of the main ideas that he contributed to that we still use today? So religion, huge, right? And again, this is the ironic position. I took a sociology of religion course. I kind of had to design it myself because it didn't exist in my grad program. And in the textbook that I studied, it was talking trash about Durkheim, right? It's like all these texts talk trash about him, yet all these like great thinkers and other disciplines like anthropology um, borrow from his ideas and he still is in use today. Like on my research project in studying botanicas, uh, sort of like these Catholic spiritual, it's like a conglomeration of a lot of spiritual goods, but there are all over our country, particularly like in New York, Florida, uh, East coast and West coast, right? It's a huge part of like brown people culture. I want I say brown people because I because that encompasses like Latinx, Hispanic, uh, Chicano, uh, and all the other countries that brown people come from. Right. So this is very much an important part of brown culture. So I'm I'm half Mexican myself, even though I don't look it. That's how I have this mustache. So. It's ironic that in a book about social theory of religion, like the author is unaware of his use in theoretical application. And in the field I'm researching, there's not a lot of people. I mean, you could argue it's fringe, so he's not as important, but he's still in use, right? And in religion in particular, right? His book, we're not going to get into this. We might get into some ideas, but uh, um, the elementary forms of religious life, right? So influential. Okay, education. Um, before he died, Durkheim wrote like on morals and education and he really dedicated towards the end of his life, coming up with sort of like a secular humanistic philosophy that would be transported through education. And again, conflict theorists like Marxists criticize Durkheim because they say he doesn't have enough sort of not radical thinking, but like critical thinking, right? Critical thinking or talk about like domination or oppression through hierarchical structures, right? But he does, he does in morals and education, like the stages a person goes through what they're supposed to do in education. And again, I'm going on a tangent. I don't care. Durkheim's my favorite theorist. Um, in school, the student's supposed to have three sort of principles or goals of the educational institution itself, right? Discipline, authority, and uh, duty to society. So uh, discipline, they'll learn to love discipline, right? That's how you accomplish anything. The repeated behavior over time, right? You can learn any skill, gain any knowledge. Discipline is just a fact of being consistent in your practice right and you can be a this isn't to say you can't be like a borderline procrastinator you have, everybody has their own process but discipline is a part of it right uh authority students are supposed to trust their teachers trust their principals trust the administration and a big reason that you gain that trust is that the teachers themselves are in control or have enough mastery of the curriculum to where they know the original sources of this knowledge, right? They don't just say, well, this is what we need to learn because we need to learn it, or this is what we learn because this is what we need to learn because of the state, or just do it without, uh, just do what I say and don't ask questions. To establish authority, you have to have knowledge and like transmission and being open and open and clear about primary sources right this doesn't always happen and finally this is the pro this is the process in education where um conflict theorists get it wrong right 
the idea from transforming into an individual that wants to better society, you have to go from individual like consciousness to social consciousness, right? You have these individual wants, individual desires, and you kind of like put them secondary or they're just guided by a duty to society. This is a process that's definitely co conflict, definitely critical because it's a battle and the institution of the school is there. You know, the per a teenager is going through like, hormonal cycles they're trying to socialize with the other students themselves anyway going on a tangent you can feel free to s i don't i would listen to this whole lecture but if you want to skip ahead just when you see the powerpoint changes but anyway i'm just talking because this is what i want to do and this is my class so another critique right they a lot of those people don't know his writings and education they were kind of uncompleted until he died so and it's still used in some uh educational theory like i talked to a professor in montana he uses it in his i think it's education theory classes for teachers and in his english some english courses okay what else deviance um ideas reasons of deviance in criminology so this is still another way that you will find durkheim if you're a criminology major you might not even know that he made up this theory or popular popularized it right the reasons why people commit crimes and we're going to go into this Crimes are necessary. Crime and punishment is necessary for uh, society to know what it believes in and collect and continuously like remind itself of what it believes in. And this changes over time, right? Durkheim argues, and we're not going to get into this much, that some criminals are predicting future law or they're just sort of ahead of their time. Not all of them, right? Obviously, like serial killers aren't, but like bootleggers during prohibition, they're just entrepreneurs but the law is sort of slow and outdated and in the end you know we get nascar racing from the cars they used to transport liquor and then a lot of those families that were in that business became rich when they become legalized so not all crime is bad there's a fun there's a reason for crime okay and another test question so two test questions in this slide durkheim created sociology and the idea of a social fact I talked about this in the first class, an external force that influences an individual against their will. So I said words like marriage, success. It doesn't matter if you're an American, you're raised here, born and raised here, socialized here. You either have a great sympathy to that term marriage, you feel like tremendous social pressure to get married if other people around you are getting married and you aren't you feel anxiety depression you feel very much like someone's a monkey's on your back right um or let's say you hate marriage right you never want to get married you're gonna have to deal with the rest of society being the opposite of you judging you thinking you're weird um it's like a huge you're like you're swimming against the tide regardless of your position you're influenced by that tide right that's a that's a good uh, sort of metaphor for social fact. It's like the tides of the ocean. It doesn't matter what you think, what you believe. If you go near an ocean with strong tide, you're getting pulled and pushed in directions unless you have training in swimming, a jet ski, scuba diving equipment. Those would be akin to like being educated, having some kind of power, financial power, um, you know, doing work, going through therapy, uh, being really an independent thinker, right? You can outsmart, you know, you can dive under a wave at the right time. You can body surf, right? But also think if you have a surfboard or scuba equipment, you just need to go down a certain amount to not be affected by waves, assuming it's like crazy storm in the middle of the ocean. Um, anyway, so this idea, these ideas are going to be on the test. So this is from Durkheim's first book, Division of Labor. Mechanical solidarity. So an easy way to think about this is people acting like robots, like in a machine, right? It's societies that are old, have a lot of history. Um, it could be tribal societies, right? It's a solidarity based on, solidarity just means like how close people are together in, in a sense. Solidarity based on sameness, low division of labor, strong collective consciousness. So let's say we're 
a native tribe and what are we doing all day primarily hunting gathering fishing um maybe spending some time processing the food from the hunt maybe doing some religious activities maybe setting up and taking down shelter right or uh anyway we're doing a lot of the same um a lot of the beliefs in that kind of tribe would be the same so what would happen if you violated those beliefs right crimes against the collective consciousness strong public reaction so it'd be like going to a country that still like does caning like uh if you are caught doing something illegal like maybe you have drugs or bought a prostitute where it's illegal they like publicly like whip you with a cane or in other cultures maybe in some parts of the world might like cut a finger off cut your hand off if you steal the more a society is strong and collective like a hive mind the more traditionally similar they are the stronger reaction against crime right and that punishment shows you what that society believes in what they value the higher the punishment the stronger the value right so these are this is what Durkheim calls repressive laws severe punishment uh, and again, the purpose of punishment for breaking the repressive law is to reinforce the collective consciousness. Crime and punishment is a part of society. You will always have crime. You will always have punishment. I think uh, in Durkheim, in elementary forms, I think it's in elementary forms. Or no, it might be in Division of Labor. He says, even if there was like a theocratic society, right? Uh, 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 maybe what some people want today, right? Totally ruled by the church. Even if you eliminated homelessness, if you eliminated like stealing, if you eliminated murder, the crimes would just change into something else. Like maybe you get publicly whipped for farting in public or burping or staring uh, or littering, right? Crimes would still exist. They would just be different and more extreme to the outsider. So here we go. As opposed to organic solidarity. So this is what, where we get into the division of labor with Adam Smith. We read last week. <sighs> we have the industrial revolution. We have factories. We're in an urban area, a city, right? People are separated from maybe their ancestral living conditions. Um, they're working more, they're getting more money, right? So this, the so social solidarity weakens, like people aren't so involved in a hive mind. They're slowly starting to separate and be more individual, okay? This is called organic solidarity and it's due to the division of labor. When you're in the city and you're doing a factory work job or you know whatever kind of job you're doing, it's broken down into little parts, anybody can do it it starts to change everything about society, right? This society functions like a living organism. Each part has its own specific function and each part works in the health of the society. So Durkheim is a good theorist to work with because he believes that the division of, society, division of labor is good. He believes that the problems of capitalism can be solved. This is the purpose of sociology, right? And I mentioned this. Society is like a body, a patient. The sociologist is like a doctor, studies the patient, finds the problem, changes society for the better, right? That's the purpose, to do something, to help people, right? So he says division of labor is good, right? Um, that it, there's also, it can be, there could be dangers, right? You could be too extreme though in organic solidarity. So we talked about in mechanical solidarity, the kind of uh, repressive laws, right? You still get your hands cut off, right? So the imbalanced organic solidarity, he calls it the cult of the individual, right? And we see this all the time on TV, right? Uh, we see American Idol. We see celebrities, right? Um, actors, sports stars treated like they're gods. It's like the individual personality is the most important, right? And this is dangerous. You know, Durkheim argues that there's a personality type where you get obsessed with like wealth or personal freedom and it becomes uh, 
you unsatiable like you can never be satisfied until one of the dangers is like suicide or self-destruction right so there's you know goods and bads in both of these systems but key idea division of labor like we read adam smith this changes society right from pre-modern to modern and our relationships change okay again right we talked about like the ancestral family the family clan and if you're inside of a, if you move in a city, right, these start to break down. You start to have nuclear families, husband, wife, and kid. Maybe you see your parents on either side for holidays, but it's highly unlikely you live together, maybe unless one of them is ill or elderly. For most of the time, you're separated. So this is a type of feature how organ, uh, organic solidarity changes our culture. Okay. Um, so we talked about the collective consciousness being weaker, right? We don't feel like together, like in a hive mind, so to speak. And it's, sep it's a greater separation due to the division of labor. And again, these are just ideal types. You know, there's one, there's not one like pure mechanical solidarity or pure organic solidarity, but among like world powers, I would compare the United States and China. So, uh, there are things, there's a lot of similarities about our two countries, right? I, I lived there a while ago, just a year, from 2009, 2010. I visited again in 2012, just for a few weeks. But when you experience a culture that has mechanical solidarity, you, it's just so radically different from American culture, right? People look the same. You know, everybody has brown eyes, dark hair, is short, fair skin. That's like the Han... Uh, majority sort of culture in China, right? On the on the flag of China, there's four small gold stars and one big gold star. The big gold star is telling all the other like kind of minority cultures that the Han Chinese are the majority. That's the big gold star. So, and this is like why um, the Beijing accent, Shanghai and the Beijing accent are the most like uh, top of the hierarchy. You want to speak with that accent, but the cultural consciousness is strong there. If you're an outsider, you stand out. And it's not cool to be an individual. Maybe because of now more division of labor in modern society. In China, there's like, even though it's a socialist country, there's what we call like controlled groups where capitalism is allowed. It's called like uh, special economic zones. Um, so there's more free trade. Um, anyway. That's a good example. Mechanical solidarity would be like China. Organic solidarity like the United States, right? When I was going to Peking University, a lot of classes, the students do not say anything to the teacher. It's like complete silence. And in the United States, it's, you know, not unnormal, not like abnormal to raise your hand and ask questions, to have a different opinion than your professor. Um, so uh, we have more independent thinkers. Does that mean we're better? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> Just because you're independent doesn't mean you're smart or successful. That's the problem in American culture, right? Everybody thinks their opinion matters. Like, I don't really want to hear everybody's opinion if you're an idiot. Your opinion means nothing. It's like a mental fart. Like, cool, your favorite movie is Mean Girls and you love going to Disneyland. I don't care. Um, in China, I think it would be people would be like less likely to think individuality is special. So there's an argument for both, right? Tradition versus innovation or uh, kind of like individual creativity, but it's not so clear, right? And these are just these are just two countries is for the example. Anyway, I just wanted to get that concept: mechanical versus organic, group versus individual. Okay. That's a test question. Um, we already talked about this, right? Individuality becomes sacred. Again, the extreme is what Durkheim calls cult of the individual. The individual is worshipped almost like a god, and that becomes like a religion. Just think of like the entrepreneur, the like all hustle culture, like comp competition, right? That starts to break down uh, our like social connections. Right, to an extreme, you isolate yourself. 
Uh, we don't need to go over these terms. So the most, Im most important function, uh, according to Durkheim, is to bring society together, right? It's not like a mechanical solidarity where everybody's like together and not really thinking individually. We're still individuals, but we still work together. For, according to Durkheim, capitalism to work, we have to have a certain amount of cooperation, right? And we're going to go into this when he calls it the abnormal divisions of labor, when capitalism starts to have problems, okay? So uh, let's see. Okay, exactly. Conflict and problems of society come from pathological abnormal divisions of labor. So again, another reason why Durkheim is so important. His idea of anomy and what happened during the pandemic is so relevant. So, so relevant. What is anomy, right? A-N-O-M-I-E. Now, normally it's translated, again, mistranslated, and it becomes the norm and everybody thinks this is what it means. It's part of the definition means normlessness. This is a one-on-one class, so that's fine. You can think of it as normlessness. That what happened during the pandemic? It's abnormal. We, didn't, we weren't allowed to go to school. We weren't allowed to go to your job unless you're essential, right? But derangement. So the, the more accurate translation of this is derangement. Not only are things abnormal, but this is going in a way as to destroy the normal structure, right? So this would be like the riots that happened, right? Um, it has a religious tone. It means also uh, the French word for derangement, deregula, deregulment. I don't even know how to speak the French word. But there's this whole, it's like sacrilegious, right? You're offending a holy order. Um, like, give the example, like peeing in the holy water, right? Or like burning the American flag. It's so extreme where this is like on, on both sides, right? On, uh, let's take two sides of the left and right, like Black Lives Matter movement. Statues torn down. Before the Black Lives Matter movement, during matters movement, and during the pandemic, there were legal battles for these sort of Confederate statues for decades. For it was like legal fights, uh, protests, just tons of fighting. And then within these protests, within a few days or weeks, pulled down. That's radical, right? Think about it. For the person who believes in that icon, maybe they're sympathetic. Uh, maybe more conservative people, right? That's sacrilegious to them. That was erected. It was a hero pulled down, right? On the other side, uh, what, would, what would be like the equivalent? Um, let's say Kyle Rittenhouse shooting protesters, right? Even though those protesters were, uh, maybe they were criminals or, you know, did things in the past, you will have social disorder. It's that guy's not fucking judge dread, the judge, jury and executioner, right? If we give people the power to like execute, not good. That's why due process exists. That's what makes America, America. Everybody has the right to go through a trial, a jury and a fair legal process. Obviously there's tremendous flaws, but it's the attempt to do that. That separates us from like behaving like an animal. So we have a uh, derangement, Right. People thought that that was cool. Like, wow, those that guy already was a sex offender or already did violent crimes. He deserves to be shot. Do you see how horrible that can be? If everybody thinks they could be an executioner, we can't have social order. We have to have things we believe in and like try to fix due process. Right. Or else we have no social order. So that's that's what I mean by derangement. OK, so lack of rules, regulations causes problems. Um, and this is how some people feel during the pandemic, lost, separated, no rules, or things are upside down, right? This is anime. This is Durkheim's. This is why Durkheim's still relevant. Again. So the reason, this is or his reasons why sort of capitalism will fail. Anime is one. Who feels this enemy? Let's say the pandemic didn't happen, okay? This would be like someone, uh, 
well, the pandemic is a good, they'd be like fired unnecessarily, or uh, if the pandemic didn't happen, the 2008 economic collapse, right? Massive event, tons of people's investments went away, tons of job markets ruined, right? This would be like enemy, okay? You have a job, but there's a collapse, okay? Capitalism starts to break down. It's a problem needs to be fixed. Another one, forced division of labor. So according to Durkheim, society should be a natural meritocracy, right? And due to inequalities of power, people don't have the same opportunities to pursue education, maybe uh, capital for business, maybe having a social structure to rely on, social support system. The forced division of labor uh, requires that society act to ensure quality of opportunity. So what happens basically when the, when division of labor breaks down and there's problems in the capitalist system, people are forced to do jobs they don't want to do, right? Why is this a problem? Number one, you become depressed. You don't get paid well. Imagine it's like the movie Goodwill Hunting, right? Is society bettered by a janitor who's a genius being a janitor for the rest of his life? Or would that person benefit from having a college scholarship, maybe assistance with housing, and that person maybe would mentor five other geniuses, and then in turn, you know, they would mentor 20 other geniuses. Like, you can see the benefit of society, right? There are people like this who don't have those economic opportunities or wrong place at the wrong time. And they're doing jobs that they're way more qualified to do. It's sad, but this is what happens when capitalism goes off track, okay? How do we fix this? So this is why Durkheim, again, the conflict theorists criticize Durkheim for not being more critical, not being more um, revolutionary or going against, you know, hegemonic powers dominating people, elites dominating people, but he does. He believes for capitalism to function better, inheritance should not pass to children. And there should be social programs. We have affirmative action, but there's problems with that, right? People will still cheat the system. There's a whole college admission scandal, right? If you're wealthy, you can pay a recruiter to take get someone to take the SAT for free. If you're, if you're rich, you can violate any system. And if you enact a law, it's not going to fix it if rich people already violate it. And if they can't, they will. If you're smart, why why would you not do that? Right? Unless you have morals. Mutually beneficial contracts. Okay, contracts so you don't get screwed over, which unless you have a lot of money, you you are, right? It's like jobs or products you use forcing you to arbitrate or not sue them in court so they can take advantage of you fair that's a more of a fair contract if if they uh, don't force you to arbitrate so the biggest one is abolition of inheritance think about this you have a ceo of a company let's say like this is exactly what happens to companies like twitter or amazon or something right they become so big society starts to rely on them so for example uh let's say Amazon, let's say Amazon becomes more and more entwined with American culture, right? People rely on it and they do. I can't, it doesn't make any sense for me to drive around to a used bookstore and try to find like a required textbook I have for a class. It's a waste of time. I don't know if that store is going to have it. Maybe they do. Maybe they have a website that constantly updates used books. I seriously doubt it. It's, uh, it's just a total waste, right? And there's a whole like picture painted from these like mom and pop bookstores. I've been so screwed over by mom and pop bookstores selling my books. It was basically like a robbery. My books were worth like a thousand dollars and like I didn't have enough money for food and I didn't want to go like on unemployment or get food stamps. So I just need money for a couple of weeks. And I uh, just totally was taken advantage of. I got like probably 200 bucks and the, all my books sold within a week. He's like, well, I don't know if I can sell this. It may be valuable to you. And he, he fucking knew that that would sell fast. And I knew and he knew and I just got screwed. I put myself in that position. But just because it's a mom and pop store doesn't mean it's better, right? So anyway, let's say Amazon starts, it's, it's the future, uh, 2043, okay? 
There's drones dropping off goods to people's houses, little robots along sidewalks dropping off packages, and just the textbook example I gave you, right? I'm a poor college student. I don't get my financial aid uh, until two weeks into the course, but I already need to be doing my homework. I need to do my homework to wrap up this video, speaking of which. Um, I rely on that cheap used textbook, getting to my house fast, and then being able to like make payments, which you can do on Amazon. Do I get fucked over on the interest? Yes. Is this taking away business from mom and pop bookstores? Yes. But honestly, what's the benefit for me, right? I'm a poor college student. I need to pass my class and that availability of that service and good at a cheap price that's reliable starts to become like an organ of society, right? Do you see what I'm saying? People are reliant on these sort of franchise businesses um, and it becomes more like an organ of society, not just all free market. Like it's integral to how society functions. So anyway, long story, long story short, forced division of labor, people doing jobs that they have no choice or pushed into jobs they don't want or are lower like uh, – require lower uh, qualifications but they can't find one to suit their skill this is bad for capitalism right this is like again like the goodwill hunting situation uh discontinuous so this is when this breaks down right it could happen at a private co a corporation a public business this is when tasks become useless you know the government bureaucracy is like a total uh it gets like a scapegoat for this, right? Because obviously it, ha it happens, right? People like run down the clock, do inefficient tasks. I mean, you look at the university, like the administration bloat, right? But this occurs in private companies too. I know you guys have had bosses in a private business that are inefficient, uh, inept, and totally do not provide a service to society. I know a lot of you have this experience. Just because it's a private business doesn't mean it's good. Doesn't mean it's better than a public one. If you do things where you have, you get screwed over like low pay or your boss makes you do work that's not efficient or you can't communicate with them, this is discontinuous division of labor. So it's like the management's a waste, wasting time. You're wasting time. It's totally, a, the whole enterprise itself is just a waste. Maybe they have some money or contracts bringing up things to stay afloat. So I'll give you an example. I worked at a clinic. It was a nonprofit corporation. So didn't need to pay taxes. There's a lot of different types of nonprofits. It doesn't mean people confuse. Like you can make a lot of profit in a nonprofit. You just don't pay taxes and you have to. Your purpose has to be for public good, right? For community building, for some sort of like social support mission, right? So anyway, I worked for this acupuncturist clinic and the entire time this clinic was open over 10 years, I looked at their records, their financial, their tax records. They were never profitable. They always operated and had a loss every year. So you have an entity that never brings in profit. Always it's stayed open by donations. So people are giving money to this business to stay open and I talked to patients there and the acupuncturist practitioners there and got to learn about the boss. And this person was very difficult to work with. The pay was horribly low. The pay was so low. Um, the patients did not like this person. Multiple patients that I treated said they do not like them. So in a normal business, that would fail. It should fail because I would teach the person to change their behavior, but instead they received donations and they were like a tyrant and they controlled the board. There's things you can do in a nonprofit where you can retain 51% control. You're not supposed to be, it's a conflict of interest to have control on your board if you're the owner. That means you can bully them or get your own way. You're supposed to have a board to have like, not, you know, let, less bias because it's a entity that's for, the benefit of society, right? Uh, like a community or public good, right? Churches are nonprofits, you know, organizations that help people are nonprofits. So anyway, 
This is discontinuous division. These are business entities that are not functional and stay open because of like ex some sort of way of exploiting the system. The patients suffer. The patients did not like the owner. The employees did not like the owner. And this person took donations from other people, which could have gone to other organizations that kept this failing enterprise aflo afloat. So this is another problem of capitalism. So again, three things. This is the test question. Abnormal uh, divisions of labor, okay? Anomy or anomic division of labor, forced division of labor, discontinuous or disjointed division of labor. Just think of dis, right? Not working, dysfunctional. Um, those are the three things why. And, and this is what is interesting about Durkheim. He's sort of like a reformist. He says, division of labor is good. Smith was onto something. Right. But if we don't have these safeguards, capitalism will crash and capitalism will have all these problems. And we do. Right. This is a really interesting, interesting ideas that I mean, the most radical is limiting the inheritance of people. Rich people do not want to do that. They want to control how much money they give to their family. Right. But what does that do? Uh, there's this concept of the fail son. Uh, I didn't know it was like studied in sociology. It's just two words, fail and son put together, fail son. It's like a heir of money, heir of a fortune or a rich family. And just that person's not successful. I don't know why they say it's particularly a male. Uh, maybe there's more social pressure for the male to be successful. Maybe they're the firstborn male. I'm not sure. But if you give this person $5 million and they just spend it on hookers and cocaine, uh, and their family runs a business and they're in control of the business that's like an organ to society, let's say Amazon in the future, or something like Twitter, where uh, it becomes a public utility of information, right? Some people are getting information from that service. Um, I know I never participate a lot in Twitter, so there's a lot of problems, right? Like meaningless arguments or misinformation spreading, right? But if people become used to relying on it and it becomes like this new novel way to get information and news, then it changes hands of ownership. And right, there was criticisms before about the previous owners. They were limiting content, right? But this happens at every information company. They limit or curate content that's like against your will. Like on Facebook or Instagram, if you're leaning one way, left or right, they're going to push you more because it makes more money with extreme content and divisive content. So whether you withhold information or uh, push people in a certain way, it's still manipulation, right? So anyway, it passes to Elon Musk, right? Now it's lost a whole bunch of money. It's become like way more political. That novel information source is just ruined, right? And who did that, right? People think Elon Musk is this, you know, modern day Tony Stark, right? Self-made guy. His family is rich from South Africa. They like were rich because of like emerald mines, right? So that project, I think, just became like a toy, like a kid fucking around with something that had some potential and just totally ruins it, right? We'll look at the opposite end, you know, someone like Zuckerberg, right? Um a public utility like Facebook for communications, right? I like to be on Facebook to communicate with my friends in other countries or use Instagram. Your data is being taken from you and willingly and knowingly, they're getting like slapped on the wrist and that data is predicting your behavior. So you see these algorithms and they'll push you to more extreme content that's like psychologically harmful or extreme and to make profit. So you see different ways of manipulation, but they both are there and in a more moral and just society that would be limited because it's a becomes a public good, it becomes a public sort of utility, right, for communication. It would be really cool if there's a social media source where and there was a meritocracy, there was like moderators that were fair and not motivated by business or politics which you have some amount of freedom of speech and um, you know, you wouldn't be manipulated either way, right? There wouldn't be information cut out 
and there wouldn't be manipulation pushing you to believe something, right? Just sort of as non-biased as possible. So maybe that's kind of a Durkheimian way to look at that uh, social media institution. Okay, I don't know how long this has been. This has been a long video. Um, over time, division of labor produces greater inter interdependence, um, helps us realize our individual human potential, must find our place within the normal division of labor, and natural meritocracy allows for most talented individuals to rise in the most important positions, enabling society to continually progress. So I think for there to be conditions of pure competition, there has to be some regulations and some uh, protections for people manipulating the system, right? You might hear an argument, well, we can't have any government interact with the economy at all, but then people who have money are going to manipulate the economy or just manipulate the government to manipulate the economy, which is already happening in the United States, right? To have pure competition, imagine the United States economy, um, you can't, be a CEO of a private enterprise and enter the government. How much of a separation or a radical that would be to separate the economic from the political, right? Limitations of terms. You should uh, be a pub in public office and get paid minimum wage, right? Or cap a wage, cap have your wage capped or get punished for insider trading. That's a huge problem in Congress. You see before laws change, all these members of Congress on both sides making these investments. It's insane. We don't have pure competition. In order to have a pure competition, Durkheim says to do these things, have these regulations, and then the division of labor and sort of the free economy will operate. It, it would be possible for it. So, okay. I think that that's good for now. I'll make another video. That's a lot of information for you guys. So I'm going to stop here.